Stories of Futures Past presents five stories featuring Venus. Double Cross by Frederick Pohl. The Stroller by Margaret Sinclair. The Dragon Slayers by Frank Banta. Boy Meets Dievitsa by Robert F. Young. Sibling by Leslie Waltham. Double Cross by Frederick Paul, writing as James McCree, originally published in Planet Stories, Winter 1944. Narrated by Tom Trussell. Revolt was brewing on Venus, led by the descendant of the first Earthman to land. Svan was the leader, making the final plans, plotting them a bit too well. The officer of the deck was pleased when he returned to the main lock. There was no reason why everything shouldn't have been functioning perfectly, of course, but he was pleased to have it confirmed all the same. The executive officer was moodily smoking a cigarette in the open lock, staring out over the dank Venusian terrain at the native town. He turned. Everything shipshape, I take it? he commented. The OD nodded. I'll have a blank log if this keeps up, he said. Every man accounted for except the delegation, cargo stowed, drivers ready to lift as soon as they come back. The exec tossed away his cigarette. If they come back. Is there any question? The exec shrugged. I don't know, Lowry, he said. This is a funny place. I don't trust the natives. Lowry lifted his eyebrows. Oh, but after all, the human beings just like us? Not any more. Four or five generations ago they were. Lord, they don't even look human any more. Those white, flabby skins. I don't like them. Acclimation, Lowry said scientifically. They had to acclimate themselves to Venus's climate. They're friendly enough. The exec shrugged again. He stared at the wooden shacks that were the outskirts of the native city, dimly visible through the ever-present Venusian mist. The native guard of honour, posted a hundred yards from the earth ship, stood stolidly at attention with their old-fashioned proton rifles slung over their backs. A few natives were gazing wonderingly at the great ship, but made no move to pass the line of guards. Of course, Lowry said suddenly, there's a minority who are afraid of us. I was in town yesterday, and I talked with some of the natives. They think there will be hordes of immigrants from Earth, now that we know Venus is habitable. And there's some sort of a paltry underground group that is spreading the word that the immigrants will drive the native Venusians, the descendants of the first expedition, that is, right down into the mud. Well, he laughed, maybe they will. After all, the fittest survive. That's the basic law of... The enunciator over the open lock clanged vigorously, and a metallic voice rasped, Officer of the deck! Post number one. Instruments report a spy ray focused on the main lock. Lowry, interrupted in the middle of a word, jerked his head back and stared unbelievingly at the tell-tale next to the annunciator. Sure enough, it was glowing red. Might have been glowing for minutes. He snatched at the handphone dangling from the wall, shouted into it. Set up a screen. Notify the delegation. Alert a landing party. But even while he was giving orders, the warning light flickered suddenly and went out. Stricken, Lowry turned to the exec. The executive officer nodded gloomily. He said, You see. You see? Svan clicked off the listening machine and turned around. The five others in the room looked apprehensive. You see, Svan repeated, from their own mouths you have heard it. The council was right. The younger of the two women sighed. She might have been beautiful, in spite of her dead white skin, if there had been a scrap of hair on her head. Svan, I'm afraid, she said. Who are we to decide if this is a good thing? Our parents came from Earth. Perhaps there will be trouble at first if colonists come, but we are of the same blood. Svan laughed harshly. They don't think so. You heard them. 
We are not human any more. The officer said it. The other woman spoke unexpectedly. The council was right, she agreed. Svan, what must we do? Svan raised his hand thoughtfully. One moment, Ingra, do you still object? The younger woman shrank back before the glare in his eyes. She looked around at the others, found them reluctant and uneasy, but visibly convinced by Svan. No, she said slowly, I do not object. And the rest of us? Does any of us object? Svan eyed them, each in turn. It was a slow but unanimous gesture of assent. Good, said Svan. Then we must act. The council has told us that we alone will decide our course of action. We have agreed that, if the earth ship returns, it means disaster for Venus. Therefore, it must not return. An old man shifted restlessly. But they are strong, Svan, he complained. They have weapons. We cannot force them to stay. Svan nodded. No, they will leave, but they will never get back to earth. Never get back to earth, the old man gasped. Has the council authorized murder? Svan shrugged. The council did not know what, what we would face. The councilmen could not come to the city and see what strength the earth ship has. He paused dangerously. Toller, he said, do you object? Like the girl, the old man retreated before his eyes. His voice was dull. What is your plan? he asked. Svan smiled, and it was like a dark flame. He reached to a box at his feet, held up a shiny metal globe. One of us will plant this in the ship. It will be set by means of this dial. He touched a spot on the surface of the globe with a pallid finger. To do nothing for forty hours, then it will explode. Atomite. He grinned triumphantly looking from face to face. The grin faded uncertainly as he saw what was in their eyes. Uncertainty. Irresolution. Abruptly he set the bomb down, savagely ripped six leaves off a writing tablet on the table next to him. He took a pencil and made a mark on one of them, held it up. We will let chance decide who is to do the work, he said angrily. Is there anyone here who is afraid? There will be danger, I think. No answer. Svan jerked his head. Good, he said. Ingra, bring me that bowl. Silently, the girl picked up an opaque glass bowl from the broad arm of her chair. It had held Venus tobacco cigarettes. There were a few left. She shook them out and handed the bowl to Svan, who was rapidly creasing the six fatal slips. He dropped them in the bowl, stirred it with his hand, offered it to the girl. "'You first, Ingra,' he said. She reached in mechanically, her eyes intent on his, took out a slip and held it without opening it. The bowl went the rounds till Svan himself took the last. All eyes were on him. No one had looked at their slips. Svan, too, had left his unopened. He sat at the table, facing them, this is the plan, he said. We will go, all six of us, in my ground car, to look at the earth ship. No one will suspect. The whole city has been to see it already. One will get out. At the best point we can find, it is almost dusk now. He can hide, surely, in the vegetations. The other five will start back. Something will go wrong with the car. Perhaps it will run off the road, start to sink in the swamp. The guards will be called. There will be commotion. That is easy enough, after all. A hysterical woman, a few screams, that's all there is to it. And the sixth person will have his chance to steal to the side of the ship. The bomb is magnetic. It will not be noticed in the dark. They will take off before sunrise, because they must travel away from the sun to return. In forty hours the danger is removed. There was comprehension in their eyes, Svan saw, but still that uncertainty. Impatiently he crackled, look at the slips. Though he had wheeled his eyes away from it, his fingers had rebelled. Instinctively they had opened the slip, 
turned it over and over, striving to detect if it was the fatal one. They had felt nothing, and his eyes saw nothing. The slip was blank. He gave it but a second's glance, then looked up to see who had won the lethal game of chance. Almost he was disappointed. Each of the others had looked in that same second, and each was looking up now, around at his neighbours. Svan waited impatiently for the chosen one to announce it. A second, ten seconds. Then grey understanding came to him. A traitor, his subconscious whispered. A coward, he stared at them in a new light, saw their indecision magnified, became opposition. Svan thought faster than ever before in his life. If there was a coward, it would do no good to unmask him. All were wavering. Any might be the one who had drawn the fatal slip. He could insist on inspecting every one, but suppose the coward, cornered, fought back. In fractions of a second, Svan had considered the evidence and had reached his decision. Masked by the table, his hand still holding the pencil, moved swiftly beneath the table, marked his own slip. In the palm of his hand, Svan held up the slip he had just marked in secret. His voice was very tired as he said, I will plant the bomb. The six conspirators in Svan's old ground car moved slowly along the main street of the native town. Two earthship sailors, unarmed except for deceptively flimsy-looking pistols at their hips, stood before the entrance to the town's hall of justice. Good, said Svan, observing them. The delegation is still here. We have ample time. He half turned in the broad front seat next to the driver, searching the faces of the others in the car. Which was the coward, he wondered. Ingra? Her aunt? One of the men? The right answer leapt up at him. They all are, he thought. Not one of them understands what this means. They're afraid. He clamped his lips. Go faster, Ingra, he ordered the girl who was driving. Let's get this done with. She looked at him, and he was surprised to find compassion in her eyes. Silently she nodded, advanced the fuel handle so that the clumsy car jolted a trace more rapidly over the corduroy road. It was quite dark now. The car's driving light flared yellowishly in front of them illuminating the narrow road and the pale, distorted vegetation of the jungle that surrounded them. Svan noticed it was raining a little. The present shower would deepen and intensify until midnight, then fall off again, to halt before morning. But before then, they would be done. A proton bolt lanced across the road in front of them. In the silence that followed its thunderous crash, a man's voice bellowed, HALT! The girl, Ingra, gasped something indistinguishable, slammed on the brakes. A Venusian in the trappings of the state guard advanced on them from the side of the road, proton rifle held ready to fire again. "'Where are you going?' he growled. Svan spoke up. "'We want to look at the earth ship,' he said. He opened the door beside him and stepped out, careless of the drizzle. "'We heard it was leaving tonight,' he continued, and we have not seen it. Is that not permitted? The guard shook his head sourly. No one is allowed near the ship. The order was just issued. It is thought there is danger. Svan stepped closer, his teep bared in what passed for a smile. It is urgent, he purred. His right hand flashed across his chest in a complicated gesture. Do you understand? confusion furrowed the guard's hairless brows, then was replaced by a sudden flare of understanding and fear. "'The council!' he roared. "'By heaven, yes, I understand. You are the swine that caused this!' He strove instinctively to bring the clumsy rifle up, but Svan was faster. His gamble had failed. There was only one course remaining. He hurled his gross white bulk at the guard, bowled him over against the splintery logs of the road. The proton rifle went flying, and Svan savagely tore at the throat of the guard, knees, elbows, and claw-like nails. 
Svan battered at the astonished man with every ounce of strength in his body. The guard was as big as Svan, but Svan had the initial advantage, and was only a matter of seconds before the guard lay unconscious, his skull a mass of gore at the back where Svan had ruthlessly pounded it against the road. Svan rose, panting, stared around. No one else was in sight, save the petrified five and the ground car. Svan glared at them contemptuously, then reached down and heaved on the senseless body of the guard. Over the shoulder of the road the body went, onto the damp swampland of the jungle. Even while Svan watched, the body began to sink. There would be no trace. Svan strode back to the car. Hurry up, he gasped to the girl. Now there is danger for all of us if they discover he is missing, and keep a watch for other guards. Venus has no moon, and no star can shine through its vast cloud layer. Ensign Lowry, staring anxiously out through the astrodome in the bow of the earth ship, cursed the blackness. "'Can't see a thing,' he complained to the exec, steadily writing away at the computer's table. "'Look, are those lights over there?' The exec looked up wearily. He shrugged. "'Probably the guards. Of course you can't tell. Might be a raiding party.' Lowry, stung, looked to see if the exec was smiling, but found no answer in his stolid face. "'Don't joke about it,' he said. "'Suppose something happens to the delegation.' Then we're in the soup, the exec said philosophically. I told you the natives were dangerous, spy rays. They've been prohibited for the last three hundred years. It isn't all the natives, Lowry said. Look how they doubled the guards around us. The administration is cooperating every way they know how. We heard the delegation's report on the intercom. It's this secret group they call the Council. And how do you know the guards themselves don't belong to it? The exec retorted, "'They're all the same to me. Look, your light's gone out now. Must have been the guard. They're on the wrong side to be coming from the town, anyhow.' Svan hesitated only a fraction of a second after the girl turned the lights out and stopped the car. Then he reached in the compartment under the seat. If it took a little longer than seemed necessary to get the atomite bomb out of the compartment, none of the others noticed.' Certainly did not occur to them that there had been two bombs in the compartment, though Svan's hand emerged with only one. He got out of the car, holding the sphere. "'This will do for me,' he said. "'They won't be expecting anyone to come from behind the ship. We were wise to circle around. Now you know what you must do?' Ingra nodded, while the others remained mute. "'We must circle back again,' she parroted. We are to wait five minutes, then drive the car into the swamp. We will create a commotion, attract the guards. Svan, listening, thought, It's not much of a plan. The guards would not be drawn away. I am glad I can't trust these five any more. If they must be destroyed, it is good that their destruction will serve a purpose. Aloud, he said, You understand. If I get through, I'll return to the city on foot. No one will suspect anything if I am not caught, because the bomb will not explode until the ship is far out in space. Remember, you are in no danger from the guards. From the guards, his mind echoed. He smiled. At least they would feel no pain, never know what happened. With the amount of atomite in that bomb, in the compartment, they would merely be obliterated in a ground-shaking crash. Abruptly he swallowed, reminded of the bomb that was silently counting off the seconds. "'Go ahead,' he ordered. "'I will wait here.' Svan, the girl, Ingra, leaned over to him. Impulsively she reached for him, kissed him. "'Good luck to you, Svan,' she said. "'Good luck,' repeated the others. Then silently the electric motor of the car took hold. Skillfully the girl backed it up, turned it around, sent it lumbering back down the road. Only after she had travelled a few hundred feet by the feel of the road did she turn the lights on again. Svan looked after them. The kiss had surprised him. What did it mean? Was it an error that the girl would die with the others? There was an instant of doubt in his steel-shackled mind, then it was driven away. 
Perhaps she was loyal, yet certainly she was weak, and since he could not know which was the one who had received the marked slip and feared to admit it, it was better they all should die. He advanced along the midnight road to where the ground grows and the jungle plants thinned out. Ahead, on an elevation, where the rain-dimmed lights of the earth ship set down in the centre of a clearing made by its own fierce rockets. Svan's mist-trained eyes spotted the circling figures of sentries, and knew that these would be the ship's own. They would not be as easily overcome as the natives, not with those slim shafted blasters they carried. Only deceit could get him to the side of the ship. Svan settled himself at the side of the road, waiting for his chance. He had perhaps three minutes to wait. He reckoned. His fingers went absently to the pouch in his wide belt, closed on the slip of paper. He turned it over without looking at it, wondering who had drawn the first cross and had been a coward. Ingra? One of the men? He became abruptly conscious of a commotion behind him. A ground car was racing along the road. He spun around and was caught in the glare of its blinding driving light as it bumped to a slithering stop. Paralysed, he heard the girl's voice. Svan, they're coming! They found the guard's rifle and they're looking for us! Thirty earthmen, Svan, with those frightful guns! They fired at us, but we got away and came for you! We must flee! He stared unseeingly at the light. Go away! he croaked unbelievingly. Then his muscles jerked into action. The time was almost up, the bomb in the car. Go away! he shrieked, and turned to run. His fists clenched and swinging at his side, he made a dozen floundering steps before something immense pounded at him from behind. He felt himself lifted from the road, sailing, swooping, dropping with annihilating force onto the hard, charred earth of the clearing. Only then did he hear the sound of the explosion, and as the immense echoes died away he began to feel the pain seeping into him from his hideously racked body. The flight surgeon rose from beside him. "'He's still alive,' he said callously to Lowry, who had just come up. "'It won't last long, though. What have you got there?' Lowry, a bewildered expression on his beardless face, held out the two halves of a metallic sphere. Dangling ends of wires showed where a connection had been broken. "'He had a bomb,' he said. "'A magnetic type, delayed action, atomite bomb. There must have been another in the car, and it went off. They—they they were planning to bomb us.' "'Amazing,' the surgeon said dryly. "'Well, they won't do any bombing now.' Lowry was staring at the huddled, mutilated form of Savan. He shuddered. The surgeon, seeing the shudder, grasped his shoulder. "'Better them than us,' he said. "'It's poetic justice if I ever saw it. They had it coming.' He paused thoughtfully, staring at a piece of paper between his fingers. "'This is the only part I don't get,' he said. "'What's that?' Lowry craned his neck. "'A piece of paper with a cross on it. What about it?' The surgeon shrugged. He had it clenched in his hand, he said, had the devil of a time getting it loose from him. He turned it over slowly, displayed the other side. Now what in the world would he be doing carrying a scrap of paper with a cross marked on both sides? The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Stroller by Margaret St. Clair Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, August 1947 Narrated by Tom Trissel All sorts of things come in on a space freighter. Even in the old days, grocers were always finding twenty-foot pythons curled cosily inside bunches of bananas from South America. And what sort of undesired stowaways do you suppose you get when you have a cargo of Tungarus from South Venus, agitized Fiala corums from the distant around Aphrodition, hand-painted lumographs on gour fibre made in Marsport Prefecture, and golden rinks jewellery from the canal centres? 
George Saunders, supercargo of the SS Tritow, gave his wife a warm kiss on the cheek. For Pete's sake, he hissed into her ear, act like you're glad to see me, can't you? The old man's watching us. Martha Saunders hesitated a moment, and then threw her plump body into her husband's arms. "'Oh, Georgie!' she squealed. "'You sweet old thing! It's so wonderful to see you again!' "'That's enough,' George rumbled warningly. He was swaying a little from the impact. "'Don't want to overdo it. Let's get out of here.' They started over to the parking area of the spaceport, where their copter was. "'What's the matter?' Martha demanded as soon as they were out of earshot of the ship. "'What do you care what the captain thinks about us?' "'Listen, Martha, the old fool's been riding me ever since we left Aphrodition. "'Says I'm the most incompetent supercargo he's ever had. "'Just before we docked today, he said he thought he'd take it up with the Union. "'If he does, you know what'll happen.' Pink said the last time that if he got one more complaint about me, he'd take the case to the executive board. I'd lose my license, sure. Oh, Martha seemed unwillingly impressed. She got an atomizer out of her hand case and began spraying quick-drying Cosmilac over the skin on her face and neck. But what happened? she asked an instant later when the cosmetic had set. Why is he so down on you? For a moment the fine etched lines of irritation and petulance faded from George Saunders's face, to be replaced by an expression of honest perplexity. Martha, I wait, here's the copter. I'll tell you about it after we get in. And for the love of heaven, don't drop any pop bottles out of the window the way you did the last time I was in port. Having the air police after us would be the last draw as far as my nerves are concerned. He slid into the driver's seat. Martha got two bottles of pop out of the refrigerator, shoved straws into their necks, pulled a shelf out of the panelling to hold one bottle at a convenient level under George's nose, and began drinking out of the other herself. Well? she asked after a couple of swallows. George drank from his bottle before replying. It's the darndest thing. I remember beginning to load number two in three holes at Aphrodition and I remember telling the longshore leaderman to have the hatch covers put on again when the holes were filled. But there's six or eight hours in there during the loading I don't remember a single thing about. They're totally gone. Well, the way the ship handled at the take-off from Aphrodition, the old man thought there must be something wrong, and when we were out in space he went in for a look. Wow, I can see sort of why he's sore. Those holes look like somebody'd stirred the things in them up with a big stick. About a third of the cargo's ruined. The Tongaras have leaked all over those blasted lumographs. And, well, the insurance company is going to raise blue murder, and the owners won't like it one little bit. George licked his thin lips. What I want to know, he burst out, is what happened to me. I must have told the longshoremen to load the holes like that, but... When we were two days out of Venus, I asked Sparks. He's had a pre-medical course, and he's saving up the tuition for medical school. To look me over, he gave me all the tests, dozens of them, and finally told me there wasn't a thing wrong with me mentally or physically, except that I needed more rest. Rest, bourgeois. I've been sleeping ten hours a night, and I wake up tireder than when I went to bed. Marta studied him. "'You do look sort of tired,' she observed. "'Maybe you need some vital ray treatments.' "'George ignored this comment. "'Of course, the old man's not such a bad guy,' he said. "'He never said anything about that time I missed the ship at Marsport.' "'You mean that time you were so drunk on Soma? "'One of the times?' "'George gave an irritated shrug. "'Never mind that,' he snapped. I mentioned it because I asked him to have dinner with us on Thursday, the day before we sail, and I want you to have a real old-fashioned home-cooked meal for him. Maybe I can soften him up, have something nice for him, none of this complete meal stuff out of the freezer. Have something good, out of cans. You mean like my canned crab and mushroom casserole? Mm-hmm, have that. And what's that dessert you make with the canned peaches and the soma? Peche flambe or something. He might like that. 
George set the copter down neatly on the roof of the apartment house. Remember, he said, I've got to make a good impression on him. Flatter him as much as you can, but use your head about it. And if you get any kind of chance to tell him about how reliable I usually am, do it. The day moved on toward Thursday. George continued to complain of fatigue, and on Tuesday night Marta woke up shrieking with a vague and horrible nightmare, but it was attributed to indigestion. After a dose of antiacid, she went back to sleep. On Wednesday, she had her hallucination. She was putting a bunch of old digests and tabloids away in the closet of the living room when she came across the jacket George had used four or five years ago when he went grotch hunting. George, she called. Oh, George, can I throw what your old grey jacket away? It's full of moth holes. What are you yelling at me for? George asked irritably from behind her. He had been sitting in his study, who was only about five feet distant from the closet, drinking Soma. I'm right here. Marta came out of the closet and stared at him. One hand went to her heart. The pallor of a heavy, sagging face showed through a thick-faced lacquer as a muddy grey. "'What? I saw you go into the kitchen,' she said. "'You were wearing your brown suit. I was looking right at you, and you walked the length of the living room and went into the kitchen and closed the door behind you. That's why I yelled at you. You were wearing your brown suit. You got the blue one on now. You were wearing your brown suit.' "'Shut up,' George said passionately. Are you trying to drive me crazy? I've been sitting right here all the time. What do you mean you saw me walk into the kitchen? You couldn't have. I've been sitting here all the time. But I saw you. You were wearing your brown suit. You imagined it. Her husband shrieked at her. It's your imagination. You shut up. What are you trying to do? Get me so nervous the old man will think I'm ready for the loony bin? You imagined it. Marta looked at him. She had to lick her lips twice before she could answer. Yes, yes, of course, that must be it. I imagined it. George spent the rest of the day drinking Soma and holding his hands up before his eyes to see if they had stopped shaking. Marta got a five-suit deck of cards out of the closet and played solitaire. None of her games came out, but she was too distraught to realise that she had left two of the cards inside their box. Surprisingly, both George and Marta slept well. They awakened far more cheerful than they had been the night before. Even their pre-breakfast snapping at each other lacked its usual note of bitter sincerity. When Marta left the apartment and started out to do her shopping, she was humming under her breath. The canned crab was easy enough to locate, but she had to go to three stores before she could find the peaches and the mushrooms. She ran them to earth at last in a little grocery on her side street. Just as she was leaving it, her eye caught the flash of a red label on a row shelf near the door, and she triumphantly dug out two cans of tomato soup. "'See what I got,' she said, showing her prize to George when she got back home. "'I guess I'm lucky or something. It's awfully hard to find.' "'Gosh!' George shut off the video to give her his full attention. "'That's wonderful!' I happen to know the old man's crazy about it. His mother used to have it all the time. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it makes him change his mind completely about going to the Union. Marta, you're a smart girl. Marta spent the rest of the day at the beauty shop, getting her hair re-garnished with galloons and her face set. She wanted to make the best possible impression on the captain. Around 5.30 she began getting dinner. It doesn't take long to open cans and an hour or so later the old man, his name was Course, was chiming at the door. Course was definitely stiff at first. He greeted Saunders with resentful formality, and gave Marta the merest flash of a smile before his face grew hard again. When the fragrant steam from the tureen of tomato soup Marta was bringing in blew toward him, he relaxed somewhat and the salad of canned string beans, onions, lettuce and mayonnaise softened him still more. By the time he had finished two big helpings of Marta's crab casserole, it began to look like the job was saved. He offered George a cigar, 
and began telling him a long story about what the little Martian hostess at the Silver Weeteret had said to him. Marta went out in the kitchen to fix the peche flambe. She cut sponge cake into neat rounds, spread discs of hard-frozen banana ice cream over them, and crowned the structure of each dessert plate with half of an enormous canned clingstone peach. From a bottle she poured soma carefully over each of the peaches, set a bit of paper to burning by pressing it against the element in the atomic range, and then used the paper to ignite the soma on the peaches. "'George!' she called in direction of the dining apps. "'Oh, George! Honey, help me with the plates!' She heard him come in. She turned at his step, ready to pick up the plates, one in each hand, and give them to him. He was wearing his brown suit. But he was wearing the green one today, wasn't he? Because it was the best suit he had, and he wanted to impress the captain. His green! His green! George's face slipped down toward the fourth button on his coat. It wavered, solidified, flowed back into place and then slopped down over his lapels once more. Suddenly it solidified into a sort of tentacle. It came faltering towards Marta, half blind but purposive. Marta tried to scream. Her throat was too constricted by terror to let out more than a mere thread of sound, but it had carrying power. George and Course, out in the dining apps, heard it. They came running in. Course was quick-witted, he picked up one of the plates with a soma burning on it, and hurled it straight at the thing that was wearing George's clothes. There was an explosion, so loud that the plexiglass in the windows bulged outward for a moment, and then a bright, instant column of flame. Then nothing. George's brown suit lay collapsed and empty on the floor. "'It was wearing your suit, George,' Marta said hysterically. She was leaning back against the wall, looking faint and sick. "'George, it was wearing your suit! Oh, what was it? What was it, anyway?' Course was looking at the debris on the floor. A peculiar expression, half satisfaction, half private insight, hovered around the corners of his lips. "'It was a mocker, I think,' he answered. "'A mocker? What?' "'Mm-hmm. You still find a few of them in the wilder parts of Venus.' They are parasitic uh, entities that feed on the life force as well as the flesh of human beings. No doubt this one came aboard the ship at Aphrodition, in that consignment of Fiela Corums. They are invisible most of the time, so of course we didn't suspect it. But how did it get here? George demanded. Why did it pick on Martyr as a victim? Well, you see, the usual way a mocker works is to select someone as a host, as a sort of base of operations, and then range out from him whenever it wants to eat. For some reason, whenever it leaves its host, it takes on its feature and body and dresses itself in its clothes. That's what happened here. One of the first signs that a mocker is taking hold is a spell of amnesia, and of course that's what happened to you, Saunders, when we were taking on cargo at Aphrodite though I didn't realise it at the time. A mocker doesn't usually kill its host directly, but it does draw on its life force to keep itself going, and it usually complains of feeling worn out and tired. Course halted. Marta looked down at her husband's brown suit, and the ice cream slowly melting across it. "'Please, George, pick up that stuff before it ruins your suit completely,' she said automatically. And then to Course... But what happened when you threw the plate at it? What happened? Oh, I was so scared. Yes, the mockers are terrifying, Kors agreed. He seemed to square his broad shoulders. However, at bottom they are unintelligent. Look at the stupidity of this one in attacking you when your husband and I were in the next room. And they are really not especially dangerous, provided you know the defence against them. You see, their body structure while based on the same elements as our own, involves large quantities of free hydrogen between the body cells. Hydrogen ignites in ordinary air with explosive force. The end product's water, and when I threw that burning stuff at the creature, 
the hydrogen in its tissues exploded. It blew up. There's probably a good deal more water vapor in the air in this room than there was before I got rid of the thing. Course cleared his throat. There's another life form, he said with a faintly professional air, allied with the mocker, but with important differences which is far more dangerous. That's the stroller. The stroller? Marta asked. George had put his arms around her. They were not an affectionate couple, but the moment seemed to call for tender demonstration. Why do they call it that? No one knows exactly. It seems to come from the creature's own name for itself, for its fondness of taking long, long walks. Course turned the cigar in his mouth. He poked at the suit lying on the floor with the toe of his shoe. What does it do? Marta queried. Why is it so terribly dangerous? The stroller doesn't hunt a host like the mocker, Course replied. Early in life, it takes over the identity of some human being, and it remains indistinguishable from a human being to any usual tests. It's so dangerous because there's absolutely no defense against it, no free hydrogen in its tissues. It's indestructible. My, Marta said, goodness. It feeds, like the mocker, on both the flesh and the life force of human beings. Fortunately, Kors smiled, it's very, very rare. There are probably only a few strollers in the entire solar system, and they reproduce only at wildly separated intervals. Once more, Kors halted and poked absently at the clothing on the floor with the toe of his boot. There's a peculiarity about their feeding habits, he said. They'll go for years without feeling any desire to eat their special food, and then something will happen which makes them greedy, and after that they can't be stopped before they feed. Goodness, Martha said again. She hid a nervous yawn behind her hand. George, get me a chair, will you? I'd like to sit down. To cause, she said. How did you find out all these things? You must have made quite a study for the subject. Why, I've read several books about Venus, and I listened to all the casts on the video about it, but I've never heard either of these creatures mentioned before. It seems to be a sort of hobby of yours. George pushed a kitchen chair out for her. He should sat down with a sigh of relief. Not a hobby, Cause corrected gently. His face began to waver and flow, as the mockers had done. Then it snapped back into place. He licked his lips very delicately. You see, I'm a stroller myself, and somehow I'm feeling that I'd like to eat. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Dragon Slayers by Frank Banter Originally published in Worlds of If, November 1962 Narrated by Tom Trissel In a gleaming chrome and glass federal building located at the centre of Venusport, Division Chief Carl Wattles wearily arose from his office couch he had been taking his usual two-hour after-lunch nap, but today it had brought him little refreshment. Earlier he had received an unexpected report that made sleep impossible. John, he mumbled. John Claxon, the generously padded assistant division chief, stopped drilling out his earwax, but did not remove his feet from the blotter of his desk. Yeah, chief. I heard from the Cantons again. I thought something was deviling you the way you was carrying on in your sleep. He raised thick eyebrows. Is their production down again? Worse than that, John. Canton has had the gall to request time off to build a new house. No, I can't believe it. 
I can't either, John. They know it's not in the manual. Certainly it's not, Chief. The nerve of those people wanting to do something that's not in the manual. People like us wrote the manual, John, the Chief added with simple modesty. That is why it's so good, good, good. I know, said John, accepting the weight. Then he complained bitterly. Wanting to build a new house? They're supposed to do personal stuff at night or when it's raining. The chief allowed his rage to climb. They've got nothing to do but go out into the jungle and pick a little old bale of pretzins every day. But do you think they're going to do it? No, they want me to go and do it for them. You can't do it, chief, protested John. You know I can't, John, agreed Wattles as he stretched. I got all I can manage right here. More. What you got to do, chief? John asked curiously, forgetting caution for a moment. Plenty, retorted the chief. I guess you have at that, John admitted, getting back aboard. Time was, brooded the chief, when that Kenton was a fair pretzin finder. But all he can think of to do now is to find excuses to Goldbrick. Wait until he sees the stiff memorandum I'm sending him. Bliss Kenton had not gone far from their Venusian jungle cabin that morning before the vacuum snake hung one on her. The thick, two-foot-long pest lay very still on the ground, and she only got a glimpse of it before it jumped. Out it whipped to its full slim six-foot length and wrapped around her throat. Fangs struck, and in three seconds, with a loud slurp, it had withdrawn a quart of her blood. Then it unwrapped just as swiftly as it had come and leaped into the cover of the jungle. The hefty young matron wobbled back to the cabin. Paul, she called as she hurried in. I've been slurped. Again, her lanky husband asked, looking up from the reports on his desk. I'm so sorry, Paul, she said contritely. Well, sit down and start recovering, Bliss, he said in a kindly manner. You can't pick any pretzins today. But I wanted to pick pretzins, Paul. Darn that vacuum snake in his fast draught. I just hope the neighbourhood dragon doesn't come round while you're in that weakened condition, Bliss. Paul worried as he totaled up the month's production on his reports. He decided, I'd better take time off from pretzin hunting today so I can be handy to help you with your getaway, if need arises. Oh, the dragon never bothers us. Bliss said uneasily. He has gotten close enough to burn up several of our pretzin patches, though. He may get to this cabin some day. He doesn't mean any harm, defended Bliss. I'm sure he wouldn't want to eat us. They're known to be strictly vegetarians. No, he won't eat us. He'll cook us, unless we can run away fast enough. But he'll never eat us. They heard a faraway sound. "'What is that crisp crackling that sounds like a dank forest burning?' wondered Bliss. Paul scrambled to the door. "'The dragon is coming. He's headed straight for this cabin.' "'Shall we be going?' asked Bliss, grabbing her clothes. A few minutes later, at a distance of a thousand yards, Paul and Bliss, loaded with all their portable possessions, watched their cabin burst into flames as a roaring forty-foot lizard with fifty-foot flames gouting from his mouth ambled through their clearing. "'There, he's gone,' said Pole as the dragon passed on. "'I'd better put out the fire.' Dipping water from a nearby pond with a bucket, Pole had, after fifty-three fast buckets, a blackened ruin of what had formerly been their rude jungle cabin. Pole moved a new, nearly finished split pole set he he had been working on back in the jungle to the front porch. As they seated themselves, he complacently surveyed the slits burned between the charred boards of the walls and roof. The roof will leak a mite when it rains, but it will let in lots of light, he observed optimistically. There's nothing like lots of light, Bliss agreed. Charcoal is healthful too. It absorbs poison like nobody's business. However, since it rains every day on Venus, 
we will have to have a new cabin. He sighed resignedly. And you know what that means? Lower production. Fewer of the magical antibiotic pretzins. I'd better radio the division chief. As the jet plane flashed across their vision, the Kentons saw a tiny bundle drop from it. Pole ran out into the jungle and was under the parachute when it landed. He came back into the clearing, unwrapping a package. It sure was thoughtful of Mr. Wattles to answer so fast, said Pole, as he opened the little package. And will you look here in the middle? He even sent us a present. It's a beautiful, plain white rectangular carton of approximately three by seven inches, she said breathlessly. But we mustn't be selfish, Paul reminded hastily. Let's see what Mr. Wattles has to say in his memorandum here first. They both read the green memorandum. To Napoleon B. Kenton, Special Agent, Pretzin Division, Venus. From Chief, Pretzin Division, Venusport, Venus. Subject, Personal Problems of Special Agents. In a radio message dated January 25, 1982, you related certain personal problems you were experiencing, and you stated that delays might be encountered in your harvesting of pretzins. We regret your difficulties. However, it is believed these misfortunes may be overcome during leisure hours and should be soon resolved without loss of a measurable part of your productive time. Pole interrupted his reading to beam at his wife. He's sorry for us, Bliss, and he hopes things will be better for us soon. Isn't he the nicest man? They read on. In your radio message, you refer to difficulties you are having with a snake and a lizard, which you colloquially refer to as a dragon. It is believed that the enclosed package, serial number 93G-18, will cope with the matter and that no further report will be necessary with respect to snakes and lizards. Carl Wattles, Chief, Pretzin Division. Eagerly, Bliss Kenton opened the plain white carton bearing the serial number 93G-18. She slid out the two and three quarter by six and one half inch fumigation bomb can. Bliss read the label. Lizards and snakes go away and stay. Only one dollars nineteen cents FOB USA. Why, it rhymes, she said, a wondering smile lighting her face. Does it say how long the lizards are that go away and stay? Pole asked anxiously, thinking of the neighborhood's forty foot hellion. All lizards, it says, and only one dollar nineteen cents. Good. But how about snakes that can jump ten feet and wrap around your throat? I read that wrong, she amended. All lizards and snakes, and only one dollar nineteen cents. I'm glad, said Pole, choking up. The division chief has been thinking of us, said Bliss, wiping away a tear. He knows we field personnel have our problems. He knew just what we needed, lauded Bliss. Pole looked up from the canister as he heard a sound. And here comes the dragon back. Our lizard repellent arrived just in the nick of time. Down the rainforest aisle, the roaring mammoth rapidly waddled. Its flames, even longer than its body, withered into blackened ruin all that stood before it. This time, instead of snatching up their possessions and fleeing to safety, the Kentons stood their ground with a pocket-sized fumigation bomb that had been designed for pocket-sized lizards. When the dragon was within throwing distance, Pole flipped on the spray jet of the tiny bomb and threw it as straight as he could. Then both of them sped away, leaving all their possessions at the mercy of the advancing, ravening flames. Oh, Pole, isn't our new home just the dandiest that a Venusian pretzel gathering couple ever had? It is dandy, concurred Pole. Who'd ever have thought we would have a cabin that was only an inch thick, and yet was absolutely watertight? The table makes a dandy smokestack, too, when it's propped up. Fireproof. 
How about the mouth when it's propped open? challenged Pole. Who could beat a front porch like that? You can't, you just can't. Correct, he ruminated. We'd never been able to cut the hide. Not a tough, inch-thick one like this one. I'll never get over the way you gutted the dragon. You cut him loose inside, just below the tonsils. And after I lassoed them, I gave a run, and all his guts came stringing out. Had him clean to the bone within an hour, said Pole proudly. We would never have it had it so good if it hadn't been for Mr. Wattles's helpfulness, reminded Bliss. That fumigation bomb, besides making a horrible stink, explodes when it enters a dragon's flaming mouth and blows his methane tanks. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Boy Meets Dievitsa by Robert F. Young Originally published in Amazing Stories, October 1962 Narrated by Tom Trisser A thrilling news bulletin dated September 11, 1996, was recently handed to me by an assistant who is too young to remember the star over Moscow, and it is toward him and others like him that the following history is directed. If it resembles fiction more than it does fact, the similarity is wholly intentional, for it is only through fiction that the past can be brought back to life. When Gordon Andrews first saw the girl, he took it for granted that she was a Venusian, a natural enough assumption in view of the fact that he was on Venus. She was kneeling beside a small brook, humming a little tune and washing out a pair of stockings, and so intent was she on her tune and her task that she did not hear him when he stepped out of the forest behind her. Her bobbed hair was a colour of horse chestnuts and her clothing consisted of grey culottes, a grey blouse, black leather boots, and a small grey kepi. The tune she was humming was a passage from Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. Thus far, Gordon had taken Venus pretty much in his stride. The data supplied by the Venus probes during the early sixties, while obscure with regard to her cloud cover, had conclusively disproved former theories to the effect that she lacked a breathable atmosphere and possessed a surface temperature of more than 100 degrees centigrade, and had prepared him for what he had found, an atmosphere richer in oxygen content than Earth's, a comfortable climate, and a planet-wide sea, unbroken as yet save for an equatorial landmass no larger than a modest island. The data, by its very nature, had also prepared him for the possibility of human life. It had not prepared him, however, for a Venusian maiden on humming terms with Swan Lake. Small wonder, then, that he gasped. The girl dropped her stockings and shot to her feet so fast that she could have toppled into the brook if he hadn't leaped forward and caught her arm. She had a heart-shaped face, and her eyes were the hue of harebells, at the moment they were filled with alarm. Presently, however, the alarm went away, and recognition took its place. "'Oh, it's you,' she said, freeing her arm. He took an involuntary step backward. "'Me?' he said. "'Yes, Captain Gordon Andrews of the United States Space Force, is it not? You look quite a lot like a photograph.' He could only stare at her. "'I do?' Yes, I saw it in one of your materialistic capitalistic magazines. She stood up a little straighter, an act that brought her harebell blue eyes on a level with the topmost button of his fatigues. I am Major Sonia Mikhailovna of the Soviet Space Force, and my ship is in the next valley. I arrived here yesterday. He got the picture then, and he felt sick. He should have known from her too correct, slightly stilted English, from the military cut of her clothing. He should have known in the first place, for that matter. 
It was the same old humiliating story. The manned Venus shot had been publicised for months before the actual launching, and he had been written up in every newspaper and magazine in the country. Articles had paid homage to his suburban upbringing, saluted his record at the Shepard Space Academy, praised his career as an orbital pilot, romanticised his bachelorhood, described how he liked his eggs, and inferred what a good catch he would be. Meanwhile, the Russians had gone quietly and systematically about their business, and at the precise psychological moment had pulled their usual unexpected coup. First it had been Laika, then Zdezdoshka, then Gagarin, then Dimov, the first man in the moon. Now it was Major Sonia Mikhailovna. But why a woman? And why one so seemingly delicate that you marvelled at her ability to withstand the acceleration of take-off? Suddenly he got the whole picture, and he really felt sick. He could see the humiliating headlines, or rather, their English counterparts, in Pravda. Soviet space girl beats capitalist cosmonaut to Venus. USSR triumph again! I suppose you picked up my ship on your radar while I was coming in, and fixed the time and location of my landing, he said bitterly. Sonia Mikhailovna nodded. My own arrival time was, has already been officially recorded, but the announcement of my success had to be withheld until I could establish your arrival time, and the exact time difference could be computed. Soon now, the news of our glorious new victory will be released to the world. She bent down, retrieved her stockings from the brook, and wrung them out. Straightening, she hung them on a low-hanging branch of a nearby tree. They were cotton, he noticed, and there was a hole in one of the toes. Suddenly she gave a start. Following the direction of her gaze, he gave one too. So did the man and the woman who had just emerged from the forest. Since his arrival four hours ago, Gordon had been wondering, among a host of other things, whether the ultraviolet rays of the sun could penetrate the planet's thick cloud cover. He saw now that they not only could, but did. The man and the woman were unquestionably members of a white-skinned race, and both possessed suntans so deep and golden that in contrast their dark blue eyes seemed even darker and their bright blonde hair even brighter. Their white knee-length tunics augmented the effect, and in cooperation with their handsome faces supplied them with a god and goddess-like aspect. Unfortunately, this aspect was somewhat marred by their one concession to personal adornment, gleaming neckbands forged from a copper-like metal. As neither native appeared to be armed, Gordon saw no cause for alarm, and after his initial surprise, he regarded them quite calmly. So did Sonia Mikhailovna. This time, however, the two Venusians did not reciprocate. Their eyes had grown wide, and now an unmistakable expression of disbelief settled upon the handsome faces. At length the man touched his own neck, and then the woman's. Then he pointed, almost accusingly, it seemed, toward Gordon and Sonia, and demanded something in an unintelligible tongue. Gordon proceeded to touch his own neck. Next he touched Sonia's ever so lightly, of course. Gordon, he said, Sonia. He was rewarded for his perspicacity by two horrified stares and a pair of hoarse gasps. Then before he could utter another word, the two Venusians turned and vanished into the forest. He stared after them. So did Sonia Mikhailovna. Did you know, he asked presently, that Venus was inhabited? Our scientists suspected that it might be, she shrugged. Anyway, what does it matter now? By your stupid action you destroyed whatever chance we had of establishing friendly relations. Gordon felt his face grow hot. When you meet aliens, the first thing you always do is exchange names with them, he said. Everybody knows that. Everybody who reads your stereotyped science fiction knows it, you mean? And after you find out their names, you say, 
take me to your leader, and their leader turns out to be a big, beautiful blonde who is stacked. Well, I think I will be getting back to my ship. I don't see anybody stopping you, Gordon said. She gave him a long look. In the roseate radiance of the Venusian afternoon, her face had a pink-cheeked little girl aspect. In imperialistic idiom, that means, I suppose, that it is a matter of complete indifference to you what I do. It sure does, Gordon said. Well, I'll be seeing you. Leaving her standing by the brook, he re-entered the forest and struck out over the little hills that rolled back from the littoral-like green inland waves to break riotously against the high ridge that encompassed the island's interior. In his initial enthusiasm, he had wandered farther from his ship than he had meant to, and he had been about to turn back when he had seen the girl. Now he had another reason for returning. A dark cloud was due to arrive over Washington in the very near future, and it was up to him to send out a bad weather warning. Multicoloured flowers carpeted virtually every square inch of the forest floor. Finch-like birds of rainbow hues darted overhead, leaving exquisite wakes of song. Squirrel-like mammals spiralled tree trunks so swiftly that they were barely visible. Venus had turned out to be the Venus of the Romantics, rather than the Venus of the Scientists. And Gordon, who, for all his scientific training, was a romantic himself, found the eventuality exhilarating, even in his present doldrums. Perhaps when man reached Mars, he would find blue canals after all, no matter what the scientists said to the contrary, and fragile glass cities tinkling in cinnamon-scented winds. The day was nearly done when he reached the cove near the shore of which his spaceship stood, and darkness was upon him by the time he climbed the metal Jacob's ladder and stepped through the lock. In blithe disregard of learned opinion, Venus's rotation period approximated Earth's. However, her cloud cover brought about an abrupt and early departure of daylight. In his haste, he did not bother to close the lock, but headed straight for the radio alcove and beamed the news of his historic meeting with Major Sonia Mikhailovna across the immensities to Space Force headquarters at New Canaveral, appending it with the information that the peoples of Earth could no longer consider themselves the sole inheritors of the solar system. Owing to the distance involved, over five minutes elapsed before he received a reply. He was informed that the USSR had already released the news of the new space victory and that the Soviet Premier had declared a national holiday in honour of the occasion. New Canaveral also provided him with an unsolicited thumbnail biography of Major Sonia Mikhailovna. Her father, Petr, was a famous Russian pianist. She was 23 years of age, unmarried, spoke six languages fluently, had a nodding acquaintance with eleven more, held a doctor's degree in anthropology, was an accomplished ballerina, and in the last Olympic Games had won the gold medal in the gymnastics competition. She had been chosen for the Venus shot from a group of one hundred trained women volunteers, and the rank of major had been bestowed upon her in honour of her service to her country. Also, Gordon heard the footsteps then, and whirled around, but the three Venusians who had crowded into the little control room were upon him before he could draw his pistol. They relieved him of it quickly, and tossed it to one side. Then two of them held him, while the third covered his nose and mouth with a wet cloth that reeked of a cloying perfume. He blacked out in a matter of seconds. A new day was dawning when he climbed out of the deep well of drug-induced unconsciousness and opened his eyes. His wrists and ankles were bound, and he was lying on a stretcher fashioned of lashed-together saplings. It was being carried by two gold-skinned Venusians, one of whom was a male member of the couple who had come upon him and Sonia the previous afternoon. He raised his head. Apparently the perfume he had inhaled possessed only part of the properties of chloroform. 
In any event, he felt no ill effects. Turning his head, he discovered that his captors consisted of about two dozen natives, all told, and that every one of them wore a metal collar. Half of them were women, and one of the women was the one he and Sonia had seen the day before. There was another stretcher just behind his own. Sonia Mikhailovna's face was hidden, but he could see her horse chestnut coloured hair. Are you all right? he called. She did not answer. Clearly the captors had used the same drug on her that they had used on him, and she was still under its influence. A number of other things were also clear. The two original Venusians had been part of a larger group, an excursion party perhaps, and after vanishing into the forest they had rejoined the main body and reported his and Sonia's presence. The decision to capture them must have been made shortly afterward. The trees thinned out on Gordon's right, providing him with a glimpse of distant blue-misted hills and grey-blue sea, and bringing home the realisation that he was being borne along the lofty inland ridge that circled the island's interior. For the first time since he had opened his eyes, fear touched him. In less than two months, Venus would approach to within 30 million miles of Earth, the distance which the Space Force technicians had used in computing his return trajectory and in estimating the amount of fuel he would need. In all probability, Sonia's return trajectory and fuel supply had been similarly computed and estimated, and if so, she was in the same boat he was. If they were kept captive for any length of time, they might not be able to return to Earth for another year, and while it was conceivable that they might be able to live off the land after their supplies gave out, it was far from likely. Maybe, though, eating wouldn't be a problem. Dead people are as unable to eat as they are unable to tell tales. The trees thinned out again, on its left this time, and he saw a bowl-shaped valley far below. There were green fields and blue lakes and scattered clusters of white buildings. Villages, no doubt. They weren't large enough to have registered on his viewscope during his orbit, but they were large enough to register on his retina now. The faint trail which the Venusians had been following began zigzagging down the side of the ridge, and the going became more difficult. They kept glancing uneasily at the sky, as though they momentarily expected it to fall down upon them. Gordon could discern no cause for their concern. As far as he could see, the sky was the same hazy pink it had been yesterday. But then, he was not a Venusian, and consequently knew nothing about such matters. At the foot of the ridge, the procession was joined by other natives, indicating that a courier had been sent ahead to herald its approach. All of the newcomers wore metal collars, and all of them looked at Gordon and Sonia briefly, then quickly glanced away. Sonia, Gordon saw, turning his head, had awakened, and was regarding her surroundings with eyes that seemed to have even more harebell blue in them than before. "'Are you all right?' he called again. "'Yes,' she said, after a pause. "'I am all right.' One of the nearer villages proved to be the captor's destination, and after passing between several neatly laid out fields, the principal crop of which appeared to be a Venusian form of sweet corn, the procession started down a narrow thoroughfare in the direction of a large circular stone building, surmounted by a steeple-like chimney from which smoke arose in a tenuous blue-white column. The buildings on either side of the street were plain to the point of bleakness, the facades featureless save for oval windows and narrow doorways. Villagers were everywhere, and all of them, men and women alike, sported metal collars. Children, however, were noticeably absent, though once Gordon caught sight of a round, wide-eyed face in one of the oval windows. He had to look fast to see it, though, because an instant later a woman appeared and yanked the child back out of sight. He was more bewildered than ever. Obviously, judging from their reactions, the Venusians considered him and Sonia to be guilty of some manner of immoral crime. 
that the only crime they had committed that he could think of was trespassing, and certainly trespassing couldn't be construed as immoral. What in the world had they done then? The procession had reached the large circular structure and was filing through its vaulted entrance. Terraced tiers of stone benches encircled a small flagstone-paved arena in the centre of which were two altar-like stone blocks placed about five feet apart. Just behind the blocks stood a primitive forge, and beside the forge stood an even more primitive anvil. A gold-skinned blacksmith was busily operating a pair of crude bellows. Gordon and Sonia were placed on the blocks and strapped down by means of leather thongs. The tiers of benches filled rapidly, and an air of expectation rapidly permeated the smoky atmosphere. Gordon began to sweat, a reaction due partly, but not wholly, to the heat thrown off by the forge. Sonia's face was white. He tried to think of something reassuring to say to her, but for the life of him he couldn't. Quite by accident, his eyes met hers, and to his consternation her cheeks changed from white to pink, and she turned abruptly away. The audience began to chant, and presently a man of noble mien appeared, bearing two strips of copper-like metal. He handed them to the blacksmith, and then stepped back, and took up a position equidistant from each block, after which he proceeded to look sternly down first into Gordon's face and then into Sonia's. Gordon couldn't see what the blacksmith was doing in the meantime, but judging from the sounds the man was making, he was busily occupied. Bellows wheezed and coals crackled, and metal clanged on metal as though a Venusian tarnhelm was in the works. Gordon knew perfectly well, however, that one wasn't, and he wasn't particularly surprised when, a little while later, a water-soaked cloth was wrapped around his neck and was followed by one of the two metal strips. Steam rose from the wet cloth as the blacksmith held the two ends of the strip together until they fused, and even more steam arose when he tempered the resultant seam with a container of water. The job completed to his satisfaction, he removed the cloth and let the still warm collar settle against Gordon's neck. The other strip was similarly fused around Sonia's neck, after which a man of noble mien went into action. Raising his hand in a signal for the audience to cease its chanting, he launched a long sonorous speech, part of which he directed at Gordon, and part of which he directed at Sonia. After a ringing peroration, during which he seemed to threaten each of them, he produced a pinch of white powder and sprinkled some of it over each of their heads. Finally, he drew a long double-edged knife. Well, this is it, Gordon thought. But it wasn't. The man of noble mien merely used the knife to cut their bonds. Then, after untying the thongs that secured them to the stone blocks, he raised both arms in a gesture for them to stand up. Gordon massaged his legs before putting his weight on them, and Sonia followed the same precaution. He could hardly believe that they were still alive, but seemingly they were, and healthy too if the pinkness of Sonia's cheeks was an accurate criterion. The man of noble mien nodded his noble head in the direction of the entrance, and they accompanied him outside. Gordon did a double-take when they stepped into the street. It was strewn with freshly picked flowers of every hue and description, and lined by little children waving green twigs that resembled olive branches. He came to a staring stop. "'Won't someone please tell me what's coming off?' he said. Sonia stopped beside him. "'Don't you really know?' she asked her eyes fixed on a flower at her feet that was almost as red as her face had become. "'I know we're the focal point of some kind of ceremony, but what kind of a ceremony is it?' Slowly Sonia raised her eyes. "'It's a wedding ceremony,' she said. "'They—they they married us.' The flower carpet stretched all the way to the outskirts of the village, and so did the two lines of little children.' 
Gordon stumbled along at Sonia's side, hopeful that he would wake up any second in the bachelor's barracks at New Canaveral. But the street stubbornly refused to dissipate, and so did the little children and the man of noble mien. As for Sonia, much less than dissipating, she took on added detail, and the metal collar around her neck seemed to throw off flame after lambent flame, and each one was brighter than its predecessor. The man of noble mien escorted them outside the village, then turned his back on them as though they no longer existed, and returned the way he had come. After his passage, the little children broke ranks and began playing in the flowers. Gordon faced Sonia. "'Now maybe you'll tell me why they married us?' he said. "'I will tell you on the way back to our ships.' She did not speak again till they reached the top of the ridge. Then, after she got her breath back, she said, "'They married us because, underneath their demigod exteriors, they are nothing more than Bronze Age Puritans. Yesterday, when the man and woman saw us standing together by the brook, they were bewildered because neither of us was wearing what to them is a universal symbol of marriage, a metal collar, and when you touched me they were shocked. You see, in their society no man and woman can be alone together unless they are married, and it is unthinkable for a man to touch a woman unless she is his wife or some immediate member of his family. We could have been brother and sister, Gordon pointed out. Do I look like your sister? He had to admit that she didn't. Anyway, Sonia went on, their trailing us to different houses must have convinced them, and the rest of their party, that we are not. In the eyes of the Venusians, you see, our spaceships are just that, houses. Odd ones, perhaps, by their architectural standards, but houses just the same. How else could a simple Bronze Age culture interpret them? Gordon ducked beneath a blossom-laden bough. How did you know they're Puritans? I didn't, at first. I merely assumed, from their reactions to us, that they must be, and then I got to thinking about how neither the sun nor the moon can be seen through the cloud cover, and it occurred to me that their concept of one god must have come much earlier in their civilization than would have been the case on earth, owing to the fact that there could have been no intermediate phase of sun or moon worship. Perhaps, somewhere along the line, they had a Christ whose teachings they misinterpreted, and no doubt they have a version of Genesis similar to the Judeo Christian one, except that in theirs the problem of creating the sun and the moon and the stars never arose. Anyway, now that they have married us, they are no longer interested in us. All that concerned them was our moral welfare. It seems to be growing dark. It can't be, Gordon said. It's only a little past noon, which reminds me. I skipped breakfast, and supper too. He pulled two concentrated food biscuits out of his fatigue old pockets. I suggest that we stop for lunch. They sat down side by side beneath a tree with blue blossoms shaped like Dutchman's breeches hanging from its boughs. They were halfway down the opposite slope of the ridge now, but Sonia's ship was still many hours away, and his was an hour farther yet. They ate silently for a while. Then, "'There is one thing that puzzles me,' Sonia said. "'Yes?' "'Why did they marry us so soon? Why was there such a need for haste?' "'You made it clear enough. They misinterpreted our behaviour and were shocked out of their self-righteous puritanical skins.' She shook her head. "'Shocked, yes.' but not enough to have rushed us through a ceremony that under ordinary circumstances would have required days of preparation. There must have been another reason. Suddenly she glanced up through the foliage of the sky. It is growing dark. There was no longer any denying the fact. The roseate radiance of the youthful afternoon had transmuted to a sort of grey murk. Moreover, the air had grown appreciably colder. Gordon stood up. I think we'd better be on our way, he said. It's going to rain. 
A good three hours passed, however, before he felt the first drop. He and Sonia were in the hills now, and the ridge was far behind them. The rain was gentle, but it was persistent too, and both of them were soaked before another hour had gone by. "'We will go to my ship,' Sonia said, brushing back a rain-wet strand of horse-chestnut-coloured hair from her forehead. "'It is much closer than yours.' "'Somehow,' her offering him shelter in a Soviet ship, did not strike him as being in the least incongruous. And when, a moment later, he slipped his arm around her waist, that didn't seem incongruous either. And when she permitted it to remain there, even that didn't seem incongruous. For some crazy mixed-up reason, life seemed singularly devoid of incongruities all of a sudden, and amazingly forthright and simple. The rain was extremely penetrating. So penetrating, in fact, that it penetrated his skin as well as his clothing. And it had a curious lulling effect. No, that wasn't the word. A curious soporific effect. No, that wasn't the word either. Well, what word was it, then? He couldn't call it to mind till after they reached on his ship and were standing at the base of the Jacob's Ladder. By then it was too late. By then he was gazing softly down into her eyes, and she was gazing softly up into his, and the world was well on its way toward being well lost. He tried to force himself to step back and regard the situation with the cold and objective eye of a scientist, to evaluate this strange and wondrous quality that fell in the form of rain, and to tie it in with the Venusian's motivation in marrying him and Sonia post-haste. In vain. All he could think of was the tune she had been humming by the brook, and the hold he had seen in one of her cheap cotton stockings. And then she was in his arms, and he was kissing her rain-wet lips, and Washington and Moscow were forgotten place-names on a map that had no more meaning than the paper it was printed on. The rain continued to fall, softly, gently, insistently. It sang soft songs in the leaves, it murmured, it whispered, it laughed. It did not cease till morning. After starting back to his ship, Gordon mentally rehearsed the report which he and Sonia had agreed to send to their respective headquarters. It described briefly how they had been captured and released, but discreetly made no reference either to the wedding ceremony or to the rain. They had unanimously agreed that the situation was complicated enough without complicating it further. He had gone less than half a mile when his collar began to press against his throat, Thereafter, the pressure increased with every step he took, till finally he came to a semi-strangled stop. It was as though he had reached the end of an invisible leash. The pressure lessened after he backed up a few paces, went away altogether after he backed up a dozen more. There was only one explanation. The metal from which his and Sonia's collars, as well as those of the Venusians, had been forged, possessed magnetic properties unknown to terrestrial metals, and the attraction between objects fashioned from it grew progressively stronger as the square of the distance between them increased. Either the Venusians had disciplined this attraction so that it was limited to objects fashioned from the same stock, or the ore from which the metal was processed was naturally subdivided into small magnetically independent veins. Gordon did not know which was the case, but there was one thing he did know. When the Venusians married you, they meant business. He began retracing his steps back to Sonia's ship. Halfway there, he saw her running toward him. Her white face told him that her collar had been giving her a hard time too, and that she had arrived at a conclusion similar to his own. "'Gordon, what are we going to do?' she gasped when she came up to him. We'll get them off some way, he reassured her. Come on, I've got the necessary tools in my ship. He tried all morning before he gave up. 
the collars were impervious to his best shears, and his hardest file failed to scratch the surface. Using his acetylene torch was out of the question. He sat disconsolately down on the ground several feet from one of the landing jacks. Sonia sat down beside him. "'We won't be able to go back at all now,' she said. "'Neither your ship nor mine can carry us both, and there's no way we can occupy more than one of them at a time.' Gordon sighed. "'I suppose we could radio for help,' he said presently. "'But if we did, we'd have to tell them everything that happened.' I'm afraid they'd be sort of sceptical about the rain. Of course, we could leave that part out, but I'm afraid they'd be sceptical about the collars too. In fact, I don't think they'd even believe us. They'd simply jump to the conclusion that we'd for that we don't want to return and would order us back on the double the minute maximum juxtaposition occurred. No, if we radio for help— We've got to have a good concrete reason for doing so, one that they'll be able to understand and believe. Sonia managed a wan smile. I, I can just see myself standing before the Council of Ministers, blaming what happened on the rain, she said. Gordon laughed, and I can just see myself standing before a Congressional Investigating Committee, explaining about the collars. He began to feel better. A situation that could lend itself to humour could not be wholly hopeless. "'Here's what we'll do for now,' he went on. "'We'll radio back the report we agreed upon, and then we'll go on with our work as though nothing is wrong. Sometimes problems solve themselves, but just in case this one shouldn't, and we can't go back, we'll build a cabin so we'll have some place to live.' Sonia's eyes sparked like a little girl's. "'Let's build it by that little brook,' she said. "'Where—where where we first met.' "'Fine,' Gordon said. During the ensuing weeks they spent their mornings gathering data and their afternoons working on the cabin. They took time out to analyse a sample of rainwater, but it evinced no unusual qualities. Gordon was not surprised— Shortly after landing, he had tested a sample of Venusian water for drinking purposes, and with the same result. Clearly, the quality that had undermined their inhibitions originated in the cloud cover and evaporated soon after it reached the ground. After the cabin was finished, they began going on afternoon hikes into the hills, tramping through idyllic woods, talking and laughing, exclaiming now and then at unexpected patterns of flowers, starting at sudden rainbow flights of birds. They saw but few Venusians, and the few they did see ignored them. One afternoon they found a fern-bordered pool beneath a white-skirted waterfall, and after that they came there every day to swim. Sonia's skin darkened to a deep gold, and looking at her, Gordon sometimes found it hard to breathe. Every so often the sky darkened, and rain fell, but the rain was superfluous now, and as for the invisible magnetic chain that bound them together, that had been supplanted by another invisible chain that was ten times as strong. And yet the original one still remained, and the problem it represented grew more and more acute as their scheduled departure times approached. They desperately needed a good practical reason to give their respective governments for not returning to Earth, and quite providentially at the very last moment, though it seemed anything but providential at the time, they discovered that they had one, or rather, Sonia did. On the morning of the day she was scheduled to undergo the rigours of acceleration, she regarded Gordon shyly across the little breakfast-table he had built, "'I—I I am going to have a baby,' she said. The news, when it arrived in Moscow, had something of the impact of a hydrogen bomb, and when it leaked through a hitherto unsuspected crevice in the Kremlin, there was a sort of chain reaction throughout the entire Soviet Union. It was at this point in his political career that the Soviet Premier discovered a universal truth. People the world over— 
whether they be communistic or capitalistic, have a very large soft spot in their hearts when it comes to babies. That spring, Venus outshone herself and hung in the evening sky over Moscow somewhat in the manner of the star over Bethlehem. The Premier had a haunted look on his face when he appeared before the Council of Ministers. He was not alone. The Ministers had haunted looks on their faces too. "'What did you do when you had to cope with a forthcoming space baby who would be half capitalist and half communist, and who was already adored by the whole world?' The Premier did not know. But there was one thing he did know. In the last analysis, any party is the people, and while you can con the people into believing that black bread is white bread, and that caraway seeds are caviar, you cannot con them into believing that a child conceived on the planet of love by a Russian girl and an American boy is anything other than a harbinger of peace. So in the long run, what the Premier did was the only thing he could have done. He arranged a summit meeting with the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Great Britain, and for the first time in history the East and the West really got together. The threat of war could not, of course, be totally eliminated at such short notice, but a number of aggravations that could precipitate a war could be eliminated, and were. This accomplished, the three leaders drew up plans for a super three-man spacecraft to be built post-haste by the best engineers the three nations could supply, and unanimously agreed that the pilot would be English, the obstetrician Russian, and the nurse American. It has been said that after the meeting the Soviet Premier and the President of the United States got together and began thinking up names. This is extremely doubtful. Anyway, if they did, they were wasting their time, for Sonia Mikhailovna and Gordon Andrews had already taken care of the matter. The name they chose is well known today, except, perhaps, by those for whom this history has been recorded, which brings us back to the aforementioned news bulletin. In common with most news bulletins, it has about as much poetry in it as an old shoe, but its message shines forth with a radiance that excels even the radiance cast by the star over Moscow. Geneva, Switzerland, September 11, 1996 The young Russo-American ambassador-at-large, Petr Gordonovich Andrews, announced this morning that his peace plan has been accepted by all major and minor powers and that the war that has threatened mankind for the past half-century can no longer occur. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Sibling by Leslie Waltham Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, August 1953 Narrated by Tom Tudorson Andro, first liaison officer of the third planet, floated homeward with his wife's present beside him. His boat, pulled by an underwater sunburst of luminous fish, befitted a man of importance a man of prestige and position. He glided past the milk-glass city where the old ones rocked and crooned before memory pools, where sticky huddles of children listened to the lyre-flowers, and where the glances of silver-eyed men and women examined and met and held fast. He drifted to his home on the ledge of a mountain, where he was met by his wife with her plain good face and she looked at the present, who stood behind him, and shivered. Maya, the Earth One, rose as her companion prepared to go. She glanced at the valley below, fingers of twilight inquired into its sands for the first soft dying of day. It's simply too glorious, isn't it? Her guest's voice clawed at irritation. 
I suppose so, she shrugged. The sleepy perfumes of the lagoon offered her its feather boats, curling, amber-crusted reminders of lost autumn leaves at home. The mountain, ripped from a vortex of sky, was kindling its transparent crags with an inner glow. Like cracked ice in a cool glass, she thought, and her fingertips reached for the forgotten chill. Why did she hate it so? This washed blue world that had mothered morn, and perhaps others made of the same substance? Goodness, my dear, how can you look at this marvellous scenery and be so lukewarmish? I don't know. Her face turned skyward. It's up there, I think. We've been here six earth months, and haven't had one glimpse of the sun. The churning clouds sucked upon themselves in answer. And you never will, her comrades chirped. That's Venus for you. But you knew that, darling, when you came. Only the words, the words I knew. But the feeling waits for you outside the words. The other woman laughed, plucking daintily for her wrap. You are in a fret today, Maya. Those clouds must go from here to the day after eternity. I sometimes wonder if the sun is still out there. Well, really, dear girl, to hear you talk, a person would think this was a very trying place, instead of a perfectly exquisite planet, in spite of a ten-day rotation period. That, too, sighed Maya, that, too. I remember when I was a little girl and my nurse made me nap in the daytime. I thought she was always there, watching me from some place I didn't know about. I feel that way during the sleep periods here. Somewhere a wind clock breathed its warning of the time. Gracious! the guest started. I didn't realise how long I've been here. Yes. And you poor baby! I'd forgotten about Dicky. He must be ravenous. I'll feed him right away. How is the little angel? Eats like a horse, sleeps like a rock. How healthy of him! she fluttered again over a misplaced wrap. "'Which is more than I can say for you, pet. "'Has Andrew been taking care of you?' "'Just marvellous care. "'Dear Andrew. "'Maya would not look at her. "'Yes, dear Andrew. "'Well, I must be toddling. "'Now where did I put my star?' "'As she spoke, the portal mists billowed "'and shifted to produce a striking creature, "'a perfect silver replica of Maya.' Flowing in cords of reflected light to her mistress, the creature bowed. "'I do your command, O Earth One.' The breathing at Maya's side caught in amazement. "'What in heaven's name?' Her question was chopped short by Maya's hand. As a mist rising, so the servant delivered the misplaced stole into an astonished hands, and sprinkling a few drops of dissolving liquid over the half-eaten wine-fruit, disappeared across the hazy threshold. Well, who was that? That was Morn. Maya's eyes sought a point beyond her companion's head, a distance she seemed to prefer. But what was that? That was. She had difficulty in focusing on it. That was only God knows what. She was sent to me by the elders of Venus as a mark of respect for Andro. "'But how did she know I couldn't fight?' I told her. "'But you haven't been near the house.' "'My mind. I told her with my mind.' Eyebrows lifted ecstatically. "'Is she telepathic?' "'I suppose you'd call it that. I think of something. Sometimes I do no more than graze the thought, and like a genie from some dead lamp, Morn does it. "'The minute you think of it? If I don't specify any particular time?' But she has a delaying mechanism, and I can think it for tomorrow, or next week, or next year. It doesn't matter. But how cunning! You think so? It didn't sound like a question. Of course, darling! Suddenly Maya stood fist high in anger. Well, it isn't! she cried. What do you think it's like having everything taken away from you? You try running like a fool every time you think of something you'd like to do. "'Maya, you shouldn't talk that way.' "'Sorry,' a smile twisted the silence. 
but there are some things I'd like to do for myself. I might even like to take care of my own son. How perfectly amazing! The woman was aghast. Here you have this lamb of a servant, who has me completely trapped. Just thinking of anything sets her off. I don't have anything left to do. Well, counteract the order, my sweet. That's easy enough. Tell her you've changed your mind. I can't. That's just it. She's a positive mechanism and can't be reversed. The visitor's face convulsed in concern. Maya, I said you didn't look well. You've just been overdoing, that's all, and... I've just been... Maya had to be rid of this garrulous woman immediately. Grasping one fat elbow, she stared expertly, past the chiding of the shrubbery. Just a perfect treasure, through the soffing of sands. Imagine the servant as divine as that, into a waiting boat. The tiny bark bestrode the wind. Her visitor's words washed over Maya, blue-scented and faint. I only wish I had her. I only wish you did too, she said to no one in particular. Thoughts of Dicky carried her back into the house. Dicky, a tiny scrubbed morsel, her beloved pink tyrant. Maybe Morn wouldn't be there, only she would be, of course. Maya's son strode imperially across his crib, knee-deep in a magnificent flutter of chewed paper bits. His greeting to her shone. Mum! Mum! Mummy! Mum! Mum! She went to him and untangled his legs. Warm arms opened and closed. My sweet pumpkins! One ear invited nibbling. You had to wait so long. Mummy's going to feed her baby right away. Na, na. The pink sills of his lips formed words with great effort. Morny feeded me, I threw. Maya swung sharp on her resentment, body tightened. Morn, I didn't tell you to feed him. I wanted to do it. I even thought about— She waited, remembering, as the silver beauty bowed. I obeyed your command, O Earth One. They regarded one another across a dark silence. Then Maya's body slackened. Thank you, she said as she went into her sleeping chamber. And she sat for a long time staring into her empty hands. Andro showed no concern. I can't understand your attitude, Maya. He had eaten his dinner quietly, staring down into the foams of the cooking pit sitting brittle and stiff, as befitted a man of importance, a man of prestige and position. And Maya had waited for the moment when his hand would move toward her body. Answer me. I don't know what it is, Andro. It's just a feeling I have about her. Please explain yourself. I don't want her here. I was happier before she came. He withdrew his hand. Oh, happy, happy! Who can say what makes happiness and what doesn't? Most women would be delighted that their husbands had been so honoured, but you— I am delighted, she insisted. Please understand. What is there to understand? That I'm also afraid. Of Morn? He was surprised. Of Morn? Or myself? Or my thoughts? It's all the same thing. What nonsense is this now? She peered through the labyrinths of words for just the right ones. I'm human, Andro. I can't control all my thoughts. My actions, yes. But thoughts come even when I don't call them. They can't be wrapped in tissue paper and tucked into a drawer. Oh? Don't you see? Ask any psychiatrist. There is a stimulus, a reaction, an emotion, a thought. I can't do a thing about it. I fail to see what bearing this has. It has a lot. Things happen. She looked at the distant bubble dwellings. In them were the silver-eyed families. What sort of things? Well, just a while back, when the superior was here. After the words were there, out in the open, for him to stiffen against, she realised her error. 
The superior was here? He was immediately alerted. When? You didn't mention it. Three sleep periods ago. And? Islitz watched her carefully. She opened her hands toward him. I was hot and tired, and I happened to think I would like it if he left. And Morn forced him? She nodded. His face collapsed and reassembled into something blackened and hard. "'Please don't get angry, Andrew. Please don't!' "'How can you expect otherwise?' he shouted. "'Stupid, silly woman that you are! You dare to jeopardise my position with your petty whims of who stays and for how long?' His fury clouded the room. "'Only you could do it! Only Maya, wife of Andrew!' "'But I've got to have some rest,' she pleaded. "'I've got to be able to think freely once in a while.' "'Think freely,' she says. He stopped before her and fairly screamed into her face. "'Doesn't Morn draw her energy from the sun? "'Doesn't she fall into a comatose sleep as soon as we go nightside? "'Isn't she almost dead just before daybreak? "'Can't you save your snivelling puny pranks until then?' "'Please, Andrew, please, you don't know what that means!' "'You tell me!' his face could not help itself. "'To think, to feel only in the night. "'Must I save everything, my loves, my fears, my angers, "'until just before daybreak? "'Stop it!' he shrieked. "'Don't take my whole life and push it together "'and squeeze it into just the little time before the sun rises. "'Don't shove me into the dark like a sightless mole!' "'Seizing her by the wrists, he drew her to her feet.' With her arms bound, white and aching, to his chest, he spoke into her face, slowly, softly, to a not-quite-bright child. This ends here, Maya. I am the representative of the third planet. The people of Venus have seen fit to single me out and make a present to my wife. My wife will not affront them. She will not discredit me by returning this gift. She will, instead, adapt herself. It is a simple thing. The house waited. Do you understand? They stared bitterly at one another. Do you understand? I understand. Her voice was hollow. He released her and she sank back, her head bent over the numbed husks of her fingers. Andrew stood watching the nape of her neck. He reached down abruptly and stroked a twist of hair. Maya, he said softly, caressing her, you will do as I ask. I will do as you ask. The great liaison officer breathed deeply. Well now, that's better. His fingers probed the hollows of her throat. Andrew, she slowed him. Yes? Do you imagine they know us this well? Who? The elders. Do you imagine they knew we can hurt ourselves, maybe destroy ourselves, through a, a creature like her? He turned his mind on other things and undid his tunic. Maya, I am going to bed. You will follow. Right away, she crossed the room and picked up a globe from his work table, the miniature of a blue-green planet with wide seas and open plains. She held the full, wet summers, the clean, needle cities carefully in her hands. As he reached the portal, Andrew paused before its flow and surge. Oh, by the way, there is a dead bird on the wharf, I'd wish you have mourned bury it. The globe dropped in glistening fragments at her feet. She was seeing a bird, a little singing gold-plated bird, whose shrill happiness had magnified the depths of her despair, and hating its happiness, she had thought she could kill it. Maya knew the colour of the bird that morn would bury in the morning. They sat, the three of them, saying no word, giving no sign. Like actors, Maya thought. Like actors, not acting, just stopped, 
waiting on a dead stage for their cues. And when the line was said, when the words she was waiting for had been uttered, would she know what to do? She was uneasy. Morn tended the water-bushes, sharp against the sullen threat of clouds. Dicky, boy botanist, balanced himself on his round bottom and explored the wonders of a light flower. One finger probed into its blue-grey flesh. The flower released a stream of scent. No, nah, he said, and backed up precipitously. It had spit right at him. He teetered to his feet and retreating, riding his fat legs with confidence. They propelled him unsteadily, like reluctant pistons, toward the wharf. Maya watched his progress with a tired half-smile. Then it wasn't even a half-smile. Dicky, she cried, come back! Her body tensed to watch his flight. Dicky! The gap between the boy and ledge grew smaller and smaller. Suddenly she was on her feet and running hard. Come back! she called to him. Watch out, Dicky, watch out! She grabbed him a whisper from the edge, and they slid, rolling on one another to the brink. She looked into the sweet-smelling death of the lagoon. Frightened eyes, flung hard on its waters, looked back. "'Oh, Dicky!' she moaned. "'Oh, Dicky! Oh, Dicky! Oh, Dicky!' He moved into her, pinpointed between laughter and tears. When she squeezed him, it tickled, and his face went kinky with smiles. "'Why, you little imp!' she pulled him to safer sands. "'What is the matter with you running like that?' Quick, slight slaps, dusting his bunting. You can hurt yourself that way. Don't ever do that again. Head thrown back, he offered her his delight. You naughty boy, don't you grin at me that way. I ought to shake you till your head wobbles. He ran in puppy circles, dragging at her fingers, bubbling to himself. And then, from nowhere, Morn appeared in a shower of sparks. She went directly to the boy and knelt before him. She laid gentle hold of his shoulders. The palms turned inward, gently, easily, seeking the line of his throat. Long fingers laced together to form a band. And she shook him. Great jerks set his head wobbling. Jolts ripped against the position of his body. He contorted into jagged spasms of limb and sound, an arm, a cry, his eyes. Maya could no longer put him together. She flung herself upon Morn with animal ferocity. Her fists struck out blindly from a time when love and violence had to be the same. She struck and struck again. She bit, but her teeth found no yielding in the flesh. She scratched, but her nails slid unnoticed from the metal. Her cries might have been the buzz of an insect. The silver sheen became red. Wet red. It came from Maya. In final panic, she clutched her mangled hands together, half prayer, half weapon. As if she held a scythe, she cut back and forth across Morn's body, to and fro, across the head and back, the face and back, the shoulders and back, furious, measured, desperate, useless, useless. And as to each thing there is a season, so Morn released the boy in her own time. She stood motionless. Down the measure of hated body, Maya wasted herself till at least there was nothing left to do but to sob and beat a little upon the earth. The statue stood stolidly above her. I obeyed your command, O Earth One, she said, while the summer noises sang. Pacing the late afternoon, Maya fled from fear. Thoughts touched her mind in spinning flight. Think, think, she told herself. She tried to reason, but the look of Dicky's face, the sound of his cry, hooded her effort. It would do no good, no good at all this way. She ran to her dressing nook. Dicky slept soundly, safely, with his treasures stuffed under his stomach. Something had to be done, but what, what, what? It was a wall. Andro would not be back, and even if he were, no, there was no one to turn to. A face in the reflection bowl stopped her. Look at me, she thought. I can't keep my mind together any longer. 
It was falling off bit by bit, and morn was gathering all the pieces. She bent to meet the reflection. Her eyes were large and hulled. "'What must I do?' she asked the eyes. The lips mimicked her own. The image seemed to silver. Another face, exactly like her own, looked back at her. She turned quickly, as if starting to run, but the room gave her no place to run to. "'What if she should do it again? What if she should some day become angry enough to loose Morn? And her mind recoiled. It had to stop, end. She had to be rid of Morn somehow. "'I'll destroy her,' she thought. She had moved to Dickie's crib before the lightning speared out and held her. Her face blanched. "'I've done it. Dear God in heaven, I've sent out a murder wave.' She groped her way to the bed and sank down, her head in her hands. Behind closed lids she waited. Time waited with her. There was nothing more, just emptiness and space. Then the wind clock stirred and exhaled. It's almost night, she thought. What did it matter, day or night? No, stop. She raised her head and looked at something far off. Almost night, she said aloud. Thoughts began to arrange themselves in a pattern she could almost see. Think, try, slowly now. Morn's energy was lessening already. As the sun went down, she would become weaker. Within one more rest period, she would be dormant. From then on, her sleep deepened with each passing hour. By daybreak, she would be almost dead. It wasn't so hard now. The pieces were fitting together. If the command could be timed for next week or next month, why not for just before daybreak? when Morn, in her stupor, would be completely unable to carry it out, and when Maya would be free to do what she had to do. She almost cried out, That was it! That was it! So simple, and yet so perfect! She couldn't understand why she hadn't thought of it before. Maya shut her eyes against the world, and made the thought loud and clear. She gave it to Morn along the pathways of their minds. I shall destroy her just before the sun rises. She pushed it, thrust it, drove it down dark corridors to the brain that waited to receive it. I shall destroy her just before the sun rises. And turning on her face, she gave up to exhaustion. She swam upward through a sea of sleep. Abruptly, thoughts split the surface of her mind, and she sat upright. She looked around the room. Something was missing. Something had been forgotten. But there was no shape to the feeling of loss that plagued her. The curtains danced in the breeze. The room breathed quietly. It looked secure and whole. She listened for the breathing of Dickie's slumber. Glancing toward the nook, she could see the line of his cheek. His sleep was flushed and happy. But something was lost. Something was wrong. A check of the room revealed nothing. She moved about, touching small objects, feeling their safeness. It was then she heard the footsteps, and she turned to meet them. The portal mists waxed silver as Morn stood before her. Maya looked from the other's face to the container of dissolving fluid that she held in her hand. I shall obey your command, O Earth One. There was a moment of vertigo, the instant of sway just before a giant tree falls. During that instant, Maya thought a thousand thoughts, searched through a thousand cubbyholes toward uttered phrases. Where was the mistake? Where? This was impossible. Morn couldn't be doing this. The room was still light. The sun hadn't set. The sun, she said, and the lost was found. 
Morn had never seen the sun. No one on this planet had ever seen it. Morn didn't even know what it was. Somewhere a sound started, low and bubbling. The only sun she knew was not the one that gave her her life. It was the boy asleep in the next room, her own son, Maya's son. The sound grew big and round and fat. So change the words and say the sentence as Morn must say it, to see what it looked like now. I shall destroy her just before the sun rises. And the sound stretched high, high, high to the sky. Maya leaned in on it and tasted it and knew it to be her own laughter. Pretty soon the laughter stopped, but the curtains kept right on dancing. Andro, first liaison officer of the third planet, floated back to the city with his wife's present beside him. His boat, pulled by an underwater sunburst of luminous fish, befitted a man of importance, a man of prestige and position. He glided to the milk-glass city where the sleep cocoons filled and closed in on themselves, where the taper trees flared, where the old dreamed of being younger, and the young dreamed of being older. He drifted to a castle on a ridge on a hill where he was met by the elders with their shuttered faces. And they looked at the present who swayed weakly behind him and smiled. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. A new story every single day.